गुड मॉर्निंग आई एम नॉट श्योर वेदर वी शुड डू दिस सेशन और नॉट बट सिंस चेयरमैन चेयरपर्सन संजय कुमार इज हेयर बिकॉज देर ओनली फोर पीपल मोर मोर पीपल ऑन द डायस रैदर दैन इन फ्रंट सो बट बट दिस टॉपिक कंसर्न एवरीबडी ऑल दी ट्वेंटी सिक्स थाउजेंड ऑफ फिल्मोलॉजिस ऑफ ए आई यू एस गोपाल यू एग्री दिस टॉपिक कंसर्न एवरीबडी and i remember when coc cochun film club had done a long time back more than a decade back uh, some question answer sessions on which gopal prepared in the night and he did that so the reason is infection is bad infection is bad and it has the why it is bad is because it has potential to destroy the eyes and uh, because whatsoever good work uh, you do during surgery and if uh, <coughs> if uh, because these <coughs> microbes uh, you know have a diameter of uh, few microns only so with any puncture or any entry in the eye whether it is a 30 gauge or you know big incident small incident so there is a potential that these can enter so all of us take precautions all of us uh, you know uh, put antibiotics but still all across the globe uh, this is a issue it's not only india even in uh, us uh, you know people every surgeon is concerned in fact people who operate they don't want any bad result if you remember evs study done long time back uh, you know more than two decades now so they could collect 400 plus patients uh, for enrollment in that study that means end of so us mein bhi hota hai wahan bhi hota hai har jagah hota hai so we are not uh, but but all this while throughout our career we are we are focused the patient should gain and every patient wants the gain also and if he does not we are disturbed patient is dis disturbed patient family is disturbed and if patient is very uh, you know uh, aggressive he may file a suit case suit suit also against you so hence the relevance of this and i wish uh, you know this could have been placed at a time when uh, this hall is full uh, halls are generally full for uh, you know quiz and uh, sfo and uh, and uh, opl but for raw science uh, people uh, think that they know everything so in any case uh, it's our moral duty to you know uh, do this session and uh, we will proceed in order so that uh, uh, we have something to give message for everybody so whenever you know see you operate some inflammation is bound to happen some inflammation because you cut that tissue tissue will react you put visco inside there will be some uh, inflammation inside it so sometimes this inflammation will be more than uh, desired so this we sometimes call tas or toxic anterior segment syndrome but i believe tas happens in all cases minimal tas but this goes away with the routine treatment of steroids and antibiotics which we give to all the patients as a routine so if it happens uh, very severely this reaction then surgeon is concerned therefore we always say that when so we have done any surgery any surgery please have a habit please have a habit of seeing the patient on first day so first day is important fifth day is important then uh, you know after that you can tailor depending on this thing but if first day there are issues that patient uh, uh, has difficulty in uh, vision because you are expecting that patient will see say 6 12 69 if he is not slit lamp examination should be done indret should be done everything should be done because patient uh, you know you come to know as soon as the patient enters possibly whether he has a smile on his face or his uh, smile is down if patient is happily walking rest assured you have a look at vision is 6 12 69 you are happy but if not suppose patient is 660 or finger counting you should spend lot of time with him you have to spend lot of time and try to differentiate whether it's a usual reaction unusual reaction infection whatever so we have with us uh, anu malik is here dev dev ha so uh, dr anu malik is here to tell us when the reaction is out of proportion and she is thinking of tas okay. so how do you uh, see approach this patient yes anu good morning everyone i am here to speak about the clinical features of tas one of the most bewildering entity in ophthalmology difficult not difficult to diagnose and fairly preventable toxic anterior segment syndrome also known as acute sterile inflammatory reaction or acute sterile anterior segment inflammation 
or sterile post-operative endothelitis, and also known as toxic endothelial destruction syndrome. It occurs sporadically or as cluster of cases, and the overall incidence has been reported in a large case series as 0.22%. It usually presents in 12 to 24 hours post-operatively. It is a, a reaction to toxic substances occurring after any anterior segment su surgery due to residues left behind by the items used during cleaning and sterilization, irrigate, irrigating solutions with incorrect pH, osmolarity, or incorrect ionic composition. It can be due to stabilizing agents, denatured OVDs, endotoxin, heavy metals, intraocular medications at toxic doses and ointments. These are the major outbreaks which have been reported about uh, TAS. The major etiological agents which have been reported include solutions and IELs, ocular viscoelastic materials, balanced salt solutions, antibiotics, anesthetics, in, you know, intraocular dyes, intravital injections, preservatives, and so on. So patient presents to us with symptoms of pain, headache, redness, discharge, which are rarely or mildly present. There is remarkably little pain, but significant inflammation and blurred vision within 12 to 24 hours after the surgery. Little conjunctival or scleral injection is present, and lid swelling is also uncommon. The hallmark of TAS is diffuse limbus to limbus corneal edema, which is variable and widespread. This corneal edema is due to widespread damage of the corneal endothelial cells, and this could be permanent. We see fixed and dilated pupil, often with spotty or diffuse areas of iris atrophy. They can be mild to severe reaction with cells, flare, and hypopion. Fibrin reaction on the iris and anterior surface of the eye well. We can also see exudates. The intraocular pressure is usually elevated between 40 to 60 millimeters of, millimeters of mercury. And patient can also have decreased intraocular pressure during early post-operative course, but progressive to permanent trabecular meshwork damage leading to secondary glaucoma. Fundal glow is usually OK or mildly poor. There is no or rare vitreous involvement. Vitreous cells, if rarely present, vitreous is usually clear, but sp spillover is possible. Fibrinoid response only is present in the anterior chamber, and there is usually no retinal involvement. Cystoid macular edema has been reported in one study. There is dramatic improvement with intense topical steroids, usually only seen after a three-day course of steroid, given one to two hourly. These are the key differentiating features of TARS from early post-operative infectious endophthalmitis and uveitis. So uh, TARS responds dramatically to topical steroids. One person, usually we give one person prednisolone acetate every one to two hours initially, and then it is tapered. The steroids can be used in the form of gels, emulsions, and ointments, subconjunctival injections. Topical NSAIDs can also be used. Intraocular pressure management is avidly done. In refractive cases, intracameral injection of recombinant tissue plasminogen activator is given. Irrigation of anterior chamber, vitrectomy, and removal of IOL can also be required in some cases. And in cases of cases which are refractory to medical management and there is permanent corneal damage leading to endothelial decompensation, we have to go for surgical treatment also. So TAS can produce mild inflammation that may resolve in a few days without even being recognized by the patient. And it is usually related to the degree of toxic insult to the anterior segment of the eye. Overall, early recognition of these symptoms and signs is directly related to the prognosis and recovery in TAS. It may resolve within a few days. However, if unresolved within six weeks, permanent damage is likely to occur despite medical management. So TAS has a multifactorial etiology. It can be difficult to prevent. And once it occurs, it can be fatal to cornea and eye. So it is best to prevent the syndrome using all possible precautions. Thank you. Uh, great, Tanu, uh, for uh, being the opening batsman for this uh, uh, wonderful session, conceived by Dr. Namta Sharma, supported by uh, Sipla. Uh, but uh, TAS, you described all the clinical features uh, we also wanted some pictures to be there so that people have a very good hazy impression that this is not a task, this is not a task. And the other thing is that there are exudates may happen, which you uttered. Exudates normally are not a task. 
चाहिए दूसरा सूच है वो पी पी ए किसी में ओवर थर्टी ईयर्स मोर देन थर्टी फाइव ईयर्स पी पी ए कभी यूज नहीं हुआ है मगर पर्पज ऑफ पी पी ए मे बी टू डिजोल्व फिब्र इन इन दी एम पी एस चैम्बर समटाइम्स बट पी पी एस टू एक्सपेंसिव ट्वेंटी एट थाउजेंड रुपीज़ फॉर मोस्ट ऑफ दिस फिब्रिन विल मेल्ट अवे विद सुगर मोस्ट ऑफ दम इफ यू सी दिस पेशेंट एवरी डे यू सी से यू स्टार्टेड रेडिसिलेट लाइक यू रेडी सेट यू नो दिस फिब्रिन विल कॉन्ट्रैक्ट सम सेल इट विल ब्रेक दैट इज साइन दैट इट विल डोंट फॉरगेट साइक्लोपेजिक्स सो यू शुड हैव ए हैबिट ऑफ फॉलो फॉलोइंग ऑफ दिस पेशेंट वर्चुअली एवरी डे क्लिक ए फोटोग्राफ पेशेंट विल ऑल्सो गेन कॉन्फिडेंस दैट थोड़ा सा इम्प्रूवमेंट हो रहा है सो विजन स्टार्ट इम्प्रूविंग से फ्रॉम फिंगर काउंटिंग टू फाइव सिक्सटी सिक्स सिक्सटी बिहेव यू एंड आई ओ पी ऑल्सो स्टार्ट बिहेविंग वेल एंड इफ बाई चांस इट डज नॉट ओबे और डज नॉट रिस्पॉन्ड दी वे वी आर यूज टू दैट स्टीरॉयड से विद इन ट्वेंटी फोर टू थर्टी फोर आवर्स पेशेंट शुड हैव रीजनेबल अमाउंट ऑफ इम्प्रूवमेंट एंड विद इन थ्री टू फाइव डेज दे डू प्रिटी वेल मोर दैन नाइनटीन फाइव परसेंट सो एक्जुलेट्स वर्ड आई थिंक यू शुड रिमूव फ्राम दिस लाइट दैट एक्जुलेट्स कैन हैपन इन वेरी सीवियर टास्क मे हैव हाइपोपी ऑन बट जनरली एक्जुलेट्स इन विटरेस विल नेवर नेवर हैपन इफ दैट हैपन्स दैन यू शुड इमीजिएटली रश टू दूर पेशेंट थिएटर एंड गिव हिम इंजेक्शन नो प्रफुल the you see no, it was it was taught to us uh, i i, I remember taught to us uh, for hyphema also and for this uh, yeah it's uh, this is a life yeah we have never have you used uh, anybody else yes madam yeah hi iop hi iop added on with the cells in the anterior chamber and uh, i write it both the uh, pressure reducing and the cyclopegics do they go hand in hand or uh, to reduce the we no, want to give cyclopegics also nahi sir cyclopegics are required to you know because there is this whatever is there it is is there in task where where is the reaction coming from from iris and silvi body so you have to you know they have to go hand in hand cyclopegics yeah, steroid cyclopegics and, 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 and anti glucoma also anti glucoma obviously we uh, uh, you know uh, prevent uh, we we do not use prostaglandin analogs because they themselves uh, are uh, slightly inflammatory and uh, they have potential to cause uh, edema also so we avoid we use uh, usual uh, uh, drugs to control and this pressure as the inflammation comes down periphylitis comes down the uh, meshwork opens up they go away it's not uh, it's for few days only yes sir yeah. and uh, generally when it is uh, the range what ma'am told it as 40 to 60 it's better to start on oral dimox uh, yes 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 like sure sure so but uh, yeah yes sir so uh, the question of tas because i i see lot of uh, tas and that comes late and uh, i try to do the two components are more important here if it is it 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 will tackle by the steroids and your cyclophagics but <coughs> the component of glaucoma and the component of later on the endothelial dysfunction these also are so serious so we have seen the patients that is not responding to any anti glaucoma agent we can wait till how long maybe up to 5 days or 7 is as per our knowledge for total high fema and how much you can wait so 5 days then you need to take a call for urgent in spite of your inflammation you need to urgent call of some kind of filtration surgery so that the pressure has to be lowered down within first 7 days that uh, i remember uh, that it happened long time back 2003 4 in our hospital 14 case of tas because of use of a viscoelastic company came it is a parallel to that person then we used it and we need to do the trap we kept the patient in the hospital for 5 days 7 days and we need to do the, the trap uh, and some cases trap was successful and some cases it yes, turned not inflammatory glaucoma if you do trap excites more inflammation i know i know i know but there is no other way yeah. but you said patients come to you that means they must have crossed that 5 days limit ha huh, now when i get a, a, a this kind of patient the glaucoma component is so high 
even in spite of all four drug regimen, three drug regimen plus oral oral acetazolamide, sir, uh, still the pressure remains 40, 50. Sir, uh, you need to do tube also in this some of the cases. Yes, Gopal. In post uh, inflammatory, especially post surgery, in which we are not going to give anti glaucoma drugs for a long duration, I tend to hyperdose these patients on maybe two hourly brinzolamide, timolol, etc., which I find that it's a little better because the uh, the thought process is that the turnover from the anterior chamber is much faster because it's an inflamed eye and so just like we are giving cycloplegics more and you know topical steroids instead of eight hourly we are giving probably hourly if you are giving anti glaucoma medications much more uh, you know frequently i have found that the incidence of trab is less so so no, why not I you are doing some kind thought. of no this is i mean Absolutely. if you tell that yeah. Timolol twice in a day and two hourly, it makes a yeah. lot of sense. I mean, if it is evidence in your hand, yeah, we I, need, I to, we need to make them. Please try to yeah. the gather reason, your data. The, re the reason this, uh, you know, you may be, uh, you may be uh, coarse or maybe thoughtful about this, but if you gave what Madam was saying, oral diamox, because drugs penetration suffers because of corneal edema, penetration may not be there. And uh, if you reduce, maybe you can give manitol temporarily, yes, yes, give diamox, only edema goes away. Then BD dose is good enough. I don't think so. I personally, maybe uh, we have to, you know, collect more evidence that two hourly brimonidine uh, pharmacology wale mar denge. Pharmacology wale kenge, what nonsense. Because the duration of action, drug like hota hai na, you can't give diamox one hourly na. Diamox duration of action is six to eight hours. It has to be six to eight hours. If patient does not respond, think of manitol, think of blistol, think of something else, right. rather than saying I'm going to Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the next case talk uh, is by Dr. Lalit Verma on intravitreal injections in endocrinitis. It's an extremely important topic, can save many, many eyes. And I think uh, hundreds of students have learned from Dr. Lalit Verma at RP Center, how to give intravitreal injections. The basics of endocrinitis. Use the door and off you go. Okay, thank you once again, uh, and I thank. Uh, Namrata Sharma for thinking about this very important topic, uh, which concerns, as I said, uh, all operating surgeons. People who don't operate, they in any case enjoy life, uh, but people who operate, they are always scared till the time they see their patient post-operatively. The next day, patient should be smiling. If not, believe me, surgeon also stops smiling for the entire day. His, his family also gets disturbed. So uh, also thanks to CIPLA for having agreed to uh, uh, support this session. So endophthalmitis, as I said, can occur whenever there is an entry in the eye. That is, we are calling off uh, exogenous endophthalmitis. And it's devastating. And uh, although we promise uh, 6669, and all of you operate uh, very early, 6966, you start operating. But if the patient does not have this kind of glow on distended thermoscopy, we are disturbed. And uh, it is very serious and it's a disaster. It's a disaster. Believe me, people are faced. Uh, they will understand why I am saying so. But if you don't uh, intervene in time, or what uh, Anu had said, uh, high index of suspicion, and if you don't manage in time, and if you keep fooling yourself by giving drops and this thing, you can lose the eye, and this can, this can be the end result of this. That means the eye is gone. Eye is gone means eye has been murdered now. Eye is khatam, thais is balbai ho jata. It's possible. But believe me, this uh, uh, smile, hap smile, reverse smile, even to operating surgeon only, because uh, he is the person who is responsible. Nobody will talk to the operating nurse or, or you know, medical superintendent of the hospital, nothing. But you are the first interface with the patient. So although incidence has gone down, but believe me, single case, if it happens to me, it is very stressful. In fact, my entire family will come to know, Achul Gadbad Oge. Something wrong has happened because the patient has not gained. So, but you have to be concerned for the patient. So how to deal with it? First and foremost is what Anu said is that you have to differentiate from a reaction versus infection. 
and we all of us do take preventive measures, which I think Rajesh Sina may tell or I will just touch upon it. So we first aims to prevent any disease, any disease aims to prevent first. If not, then if it occurs, then you have to treat. For treatment, you have to have early diagnosis. Don't miss the bus. Don't say the patient by follow-up is not required, I have heard a lot of people saying, follow-up is not required, you can come. But early diagnosis is important. And prompt treatment is important. Every, whether it's, suppose next day is a Diwali day or a holiday or you are going out, but no, you cannot till the time you see your patient. If you have to give injection, you give on the same day. If not, believe me, you will lose the eye. So for prevention, which I think Rajesh Sena will tell, but uh, I will just touch upon a couple of things that all of us are wise enough today to take care of pre-operative sources of infection. And if the eye is red, even on the operating day, or you know, patient has some uh, neighboring infection. So this we should not, you should not. You should defer the surgery because cat is a elective surgery. You can easily postpone by a couple of days or weeks. Per operatively, all of us pay uh, attention to the sterile instrumentation, ETO and uh, autoclaves. You should never compromise on irrigating fluids. You see visco irrigating fluids are some things which go inside the eye. So never go for cheap fluids which, you know, suppose you are using the lactate of a reputed company, 20 rupees, somebody selling 15 rupees, so don't go for it. Have a standard company equipment. Other thing is isolating the lashes. You see, lashes should not come in the way. Uh, now there's very good drapes are available. Betadine, betadine and betadine is one thing because which has, uh, although despite betadine, also infection can occur, but betadine installation just before surgery, once in the waiting room, once on the table is important. Then most important is because, because the wound entry has to be uh, good. Good wound construction. If your wound is irregular, believe me, it will, uh, it will allow ingress of organism. So good wound construction is very, very good. And if in doubt wound is not good, then don't hesitate to put a suture there. Then intracameral antibiotics have come in a very big way. Very big way means I see virtually all the high volume catheter surgeons, uh, you know, at the end of surgery, they will, uh, you know, uh, with moxifloxacin, is a moxisip is available, where you can put. But, uh, uh, you know, actually three antibiotics are there which have been tested. One is vancomycin, one is cefuroxime, and third is uh, moxifloxin. But moxifloxin is uh, one antibiotic because a lot of data is available from India, from Arvind Eye Care System, where lakhs and lakhs of patients uh, have been done. And this study has been quoted by Stanley Chang also, and, uh, and everybody uh, yeah, uses it, Arvind data, that it does have a role. So I think uh, most of the surgeons adopt, and so should you that you should, at the end of surgery, put this uh, antibiotic. It may cause tasks sometimes, but uh, infection, it may take care. So, as I said, uh, prevention is the hallmark, but for treatment, I think uh, there are two, three modalities there, but intravital antibiotics, which I will touch upon, with Tetmi, Dr. Malika will tell, uh, because it's, it's just like a pus in the eye. It's, it's an infection in the eye. Vitreous cavity is full of infection. So there are microorganisms, exudates, uh, in the vitreous cavity, which, uh, which have the potential to, because of their toxin, this thing have the potential to destroy the retina, so you have to act very early. So intravital antibiotics has this, uh, is the mainstay of treatment. If you do it early enough, fast enough, uh, you will save the eye in majority of these patients, unless the organisms are not sensitive to the antibiotic, but uh, majority of the patients you will. Because sometimes you see uh, patients, uh, uh, some, uh, somebody may ring you up that there's infection, so I tell them, Injection lagado. and by the time patient reaches us, he is already responding. So intravital antibodies act as a first aid in the management of post-operative enteritis. And as I said, if uh, organism is sensitive and you have injected early enough, mild to moderate patients uh, will respond excellently. So key issues always are delay. You keep delaying because of multiple reasons, and delay that you do not differentiate from TAS or not willing to accept that my case has developed infection. And second is that you, there's a hesitancy in giving intravenous injection. Normally you will give, okay, you give some drops, I'll see you tomorrow, I'll see you day after tomorrow, tomorrow is Sunday, you come on Monday. That's not done. So delay in giving appropriate treatment can, and this I think uh, Anu has already covered, uh, we should differentiate TAS and endothelmitis. The reason is that uh, treatment is vastly different in both of them. In one, you load the patient with steroids. Load means give him one hourly prednisolone, give him IV prednisolone. Whereas in infection, 
it's not steroids, but it is primarily antibiotics. So you have to differentiate. And this chart I found very useful uh, uh, that, uh, you know, differentiate with the signs and symptoms of TAS on left side and, you know, infectious enosomitis. I know uh, NU has covered, but there's uh, worth emphasizing that if there's a lot of lead edema in chemosis, this points towards infection. Limbus to limbus coronary edema, she has told, uh, is, is primarily feature of TAS because the, because the insult is inside the chamber, therefore the whole, whole cornea is involved. In infection, the, this is localized. IOP in infection is slightly on the lower side rather than higher side. But in TAS, it can be high. And we already have a discussion and experience from uh, a lot of other people that how to manage this. But if in doubt, most of the patients, you know, this chart will definitely help. But if in doubt, and patient has unusual pain, decreased vision, a lot of lidema chemosis, corneal haze, hypopion, or exudates, in always are on the side of infection. You will never, never repent. You should, uh, you know, give this internal antibiotic injection. So I'll just show you a couple of examples, like, uh, you know, these two patients, uh, one is a young lady who had undergone RK plus uh, cataract uh, long time back, and this, uh, this uh, other patient. So we did, uh, you know, take recourse to this. But uh, in this patient, we did not give any intravitreal antibiotic injection. We loaded the patient with steroids. I'll just show you, this was uh, uh, one patient. You see the glow is reasonably okay. Not the best, but the glow is there. AC reaction is there, and fundus picture is like this. You load the patient steroids from all the roots, and at the end of, uh, you know, patient gradually improving day by day, day by day. At the end of it, uh, whatever you wanted, 6-6, six, six, patient has recovered. No internal antibodies given at all. So another patient, uh, this lady had undergone RK a long time back, and then she underwent cataract surgery. You see corneal totally edematous. But what uh, uh, tilted my diagnosis towards TAS was this whitish material. If it is yellowish, you think of infection, but it's whitish, you think of uh, maybe it's a lens matter or some, uh, you know, clump there. So again, uh, loaded this patient with steroids from all possible routes. It took some time. Picture every day, you see this, uh, this cornea edema is resolving, then this lens matter uh, is getting absorbed. Even these droppings have improved. Ultimately, patient recovers within. So if you differentiate and tilt towards TAS, then load the patient with steroids. This is one of my recently operated the diabetic patient. This was the day one, as soon as I saw this patient, because he had a combined detachment. So we did a vitreous surgery on him. But first post-op day, you see this patient had like this. But see, this glow is reasonably good. So I thought TAS. But uh, a lot of uh, my fellow said, nee, sir, injection dena hai isko, antibody lagana. So I said, let's wait. So this patient had, uh, you know, uh, history of multiple injections. In fact, ozutrex, so, so many things had been done. He underwent vitreous surgery, and this was the result. So we persisted. You see, aim to show this is follow up very religiously. Chabbis, Atthais, every day you take a picture, and hyperpion is going down, going down. Ultimately, this patient recovered. But diagnosis was TAS, not, we did not give any antibiotic injection. This was the end result. But if the picture is like this, so immediate internal antibiotic injection is required. Then you can't delay. You can't delay because as I told you, if you delay, end result can be thysis bulbi. That can happen. So if it's a definitive enthalmitis and patient has uh, whatever vision, I don't uh, differentiate between, say, hand motions, PLPR, inaccurate. If he has not received any injection, you should immediately give internal antibiotic injection. And what to give, when to give, how to give, I think today Google has taught us and every, uh, you know, uh, literature also tells us. The CME series we had uh, from AIS published long time back. Till today it has all the information, what to give, when to give, how to give, and how to follow up. When to give is, I said, earlier the better. Or if you are following up a patient of task, the moment it worsens, immediately give the in injection. And when not to give also, you should know. The patient has, say, a very virulent infection, which I think Malika will touch upon, vision is only PL, or there's a traumatic uh, uh, insult, foreign body here. In any case, we are, or there's a detachment there. So in any case, we have to go inside. Last I will say is, if the first internal does not work, if first internal injection is not working, I think you should start thinking that this patient may require vitreous surgery. Which to give, I think, uh, 
most of us, uh, most of us uh, give Vanco and Kefta, but uh, if the infection is very virulent, you can give uh, imipenem or cholestine where gram negative is being suspected. But majority, the first is Vanco and Kefta. Amikacin and aminoglycoside went into disrepute, disrepute slightly because of the propensity to cause macular infarction. But if you take care of the dilution errors, I think they are also pretty safe. In fact, today, Amica effectivity towards gram negative is more than Kefta. Vanco still maintains its supremacy for gram positive. That is more than 90% sensitivity. But Kefta is sensitive to gram negative is now 50, 50, 60%. This is the chart I think uh, which uh, everybody should have in this operation theater wall. And uh, I'm thankful to CIPLA. They helped in uh, you know distributing all these charts to the entire body of AIS. Not once, not twice, so many times we did it. So this chart you can have from CIPLA or maybe you can write to AS office, they will supply. How to give? Because two injections are involved, so you have to decompress the eye. You can't give two injections in the eye because we, it's a blind, uh, uh, this thing, injection in the sense that we are giving one for gram positive, one for negative, and 0.1 ml of each, so I cannot tolerate 0.2 ml of injection. So you have to decompress the globe. And the best way in infection, in infection to decompress is biopsy. And most of us, uh, NTS7 surgeon may not be used to doing vitreous biopsy, so best is to do NTS7 paracentesis. Because this will lower the pressure, then you can inject two injections. Sequentially, don't mix up also. Don't take in one syringe. How to give, rotate slowly. Don't give a jet like this, because that will hit directly to the macula. And 30 gauge needle has to be used. Very important is after we are given the injection, then adjunctive treatment is important. Adjunctive treatment, what corneal surgeons give in corneal uh, infection or corneal abscess, is this concentrated cefazolin and tobacin. All my patients will get concentrated cefazolin and tobacin along with cyclobrejects. And steroids, normally I will start after seeing the patient uh, maybe after 24, 12 to 24 hours. And these are important because as the, as the intravital drugs are, you know, decreasing in concentration, these drugs, oral ciplox is known to penetrate inside the eye. And we give it in the dosage of 1,000 milligram uh, twice a day. Very important is how to judge. Because you have given the injection, you have given the adjunctive treatment. First one or two days are very critical. As I said, patient comes with smile on day one, you are happy that patient is responding. But any worsening, start preparing for PPV. No worsening and patient pain has gone, even though vision may not improve. Improvement of vision may take time. So no worsening, follow the patient again after 12 hours. And slowly, slowly, glow will come, the reaction will decrease, and you will see the fundus also. So a couple of examples before I conclude. This one patient at presentation, hand motions, no glow at all. And you see, we started uh, with Vanco and Kefta, but important is see the patient every day, every day, if not twice a day. And slowly, slowly, the Senechia breaks, the fibrin melts away, glow starts coming, and vision takes time. It takes a couple of weeks for vision to come. So this is one patient who, you know, he came with reaction like this, a lot of corneal reaction, hypopion, but no interval had been given by the surgeon. So I thought I will still till the time I convince him for vitrectomy. Uh, we did give him interval injection, and fortunately for me, this patient responded and vitreous surgery was not required. So if the interval has not been given, you can still, uh, you know, consider giving interval injection. This was another patient uh, where we... So in, in the RPC casualty, we analyzed that all these patients who come for injections, only 30% only patient had received interval antibiotics. Most of them were, you know, on topical drops or subcon injections. So that is not good. If it is infection, please give intravitreal because that is the site of infection. So that you have to give intravitreal rather than, you know, continuing topical drops. So this is another one patient where, you know, it was full of vitreous exudates. We gave, uh, we gave interval antibiotic injection because he had not received fortunately responded only to antibiotic injection only. So moral of the story is that give intravitreal antibiotic injection earliest possible if it is not already given. Last situation is that you have to refer it to Malika if the patient is not responding or in, it is deteriorating despite intravitreal injection, then I think vitreous surgery is warranted because vitreous surgery is likened as a IND because you have to debulk. You once you debulk the vitreous, then I think a response can improve. So these kind of surge, pa surge patients will require vitrectomy, and Malika will talk about this vitrectomy. So just to conclude, uh, interval injections uh, are the mainstay of treatment if the patient presents early and response is pretty good. 
and as I said, it's like a first aid being given to the patients of infection. And uh, these are the patients, so if you give this first aid in time and properly and follow this patient uh, nicely, the response is pretty good. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for this uh, great talk. Uh, would you give intravictal uh, antifungal at the same time if you have a doubt? And would you give a steroid intravictal as a routine? So if the clinical picture uh, forces me to think about fungus like it's a fungal granuloma, then I will. But as a routine, uh, if the patient has presented between three to five days, then I will give only antibiotic. If patient has delayed presentation, in delayed presentation, the possibility of fungus is very, very high. Then I will. And whenever I give anti and intravitreal voriconazole, that is my preferred drug. So in that, I will combine both the antibiotics as well as antifungal. But uh, usual presentation, acute onset of anathelmitis, uh, I will not. But if the patient is not responding the way I showed, then you start thinking your tentacles are high, why it is not responding. Either the sensitivity is different, because by that time, culture sensitivity report or, or PCR report uh, will come. So, or you start thinking of fungus. And believe me, fungus infection in this country is much higher than what EVS reported. EVS said only 3% are fungus. In our scenario, I think more than 15, 20% patients are fungal. And if the patient is immunosuppressed, suppose the patient gives history of immunosuppression, chronic immunosuppression, then also you should keep in mind antifungal either. Intravictorial fluoroquinolones as the treatment of first choice. You said you put Vanco and Cefazidine as the yeah, first. mostly, yeah. But mostly. do you sometimes think that it's better to add a fluoroquinolone uh, in yeah. terms of ciprofloxacin or moxiflox? Because uh, I feel that you have a very wide Yeah, advantage. the advantage of fluoroquinolone is that only one injection may work. You yeah, see, instead of two injections, because we did uh, one study on uh, uh, intravitreal ciplox, ciprofloxacin, and it uh, did work very nicely. Spectrum. Right. That, that's what I said. Yes. So the advantage of that is in those the, in that study, instead of giving two antibodies, we gave only one. Fluoroquinolone has the advantage of wide spectrum, so you can give only one. And they can cover. And the, the dosage is around thousand micro. Yes, and they cover the atypical uh, bacteria like Mycobacteria, Chlamydia. They also cover fungus actually. Yes. Fluoroquinolone. It's so a good. It's a very good suggestion. It's a very good. Uh, so I tend to use it as a first line also. Intervitreal. Yes. Do you advise uh, yes. Vitreous tap or not, sir, before huh? injecting vitreous tap? Yeah, I said that vitreous tap, if you are confident, do it. But if not, uh, tap is not good. Actually, biopsy is better because I don't want to inject, say, uh, put this 21 gauge and pull. Pulling is not good. So if it, you know, gentle pull, it's okay. If you don't exert your, uh, you know, all the might to take out the sample. So if you are well versed with the uh, vitreous biopsy, that is better. If not, I think for usual NTA segment surgeons, I will say paracentesis is better. Because the trauma caused by uh, vitreous tap, if you are pulling, is, uh, is can result in a lot of traction to the vitreous base. Yes. Sir, we are doing vitreous tap uh, frequently, sir, before uh, uh, giving intravitreal injections. But 90 percent of cases, we are getting negative for uh, uh, any microbials or uh, even fungal also. How to deal with it uh, while we are injecting uh, intravitreal injections or while doing core vitrectomy? So what is 90% is? Negative, negative culture or negative. Yeah, yeah, that you can't help it. That depends on where you are, because in which city you are, what kind of lab it is. Like I identified, I am in Delhi, I identified one lab in uh, Gurgaon. That lady does a fantastic job. If you see LV Prasad data, they, their pickup rate is very, very high, more than 60%. EVS, mm -hmm. EVS 25% uh, was the pickup rate. So that depends on how good your lab is and when you have inoculated. You see, you should have these three plates ready, chocolate agar, saborides, and this should be ready on the table mm -hmm. so, you, so that you inoculate. Don't wait for that uh, syringe to your material to dry up and then you inject. So it is your onus also, how you, you know, prepare your samples. So I think uh, that point is well taken. I don't, uh, you see, I go by more clinical uh, sense rather than by microbiological. Or you can use this PCR, this, uh, you know, exciton. They do a wonderful job. You can send this sample and uh, to this Bangalore, and they give you results within 24 hours. And their pickup rate is very, very high. If you depend on that amplification, you know, this PCR, it works much better than a routine lab where you send the sample. But this sampling is important because this can save your skin. Tomorrow, suppose there is a, a medical case, and if you're not sending the sample, you can be in soup. 
so sample bhejna to hai but uh, you have to depend on more on clinical sense rather than sampling like malika was saying that suppose patient is not responding to say banco kefta so i'll think of say gram negative think of cholestein think of imipenem so start or think of fungus something of that sort instead of vanco septa why don't you go to vanco or vanco plus imipenem or vanco plus uh, cholestein can you can First you can i said that i said this is the commonest we use most of it but you can because most of the infections are not so virulent most of the infections if you catch on uh, you know third fourth day are not so virulent if virulent then what you say is correct if you suspect of gram negative and vision is barely you know he can't see hands also there is if you see hand and there you know it's a mild to moderate infection then uh, vanco kefta may work but if it is very virulent then uh, what you are saying that would be the right see, choice that is just the guideline whenever you see a case you have to first have your own idea whether i'm dealing with a gram negative or positive if it's positive whether it's pneumococcus or is it your staph that you have to have a idea in your mind and you have to uh, tailor your antibiotic based on what you think it really is not that vancosepta only yeah yeah so many it times if you think it's pneumococcus you may change to a ciprioxone or if you think it's an anaerobic bacteria for then you put clindamycin in addition to whatever so definitely lot of uh, most of the time our uh, cultures will be not very uh, they will be negative so we ultimately we are depending on our clinical judgment yeah. and that's what saves the day so as i said this is first aid first aid may not be complete now first is to save so you should shift to you know the stronger antibiotics depending on your clinical sense and the picture if i'm suspecting negative or most of this uh, you know when this epidemic occurs so suppose in any one place there are you know 20 30 cases most of them will be pseudomonas so then you don't give this how much you suggest uh, fortified antibiotics sir in how much fortified antibiotics vanco septa or uh, fortified yes sir so i what vanco because once we give vanco only 0.1 is utilized so I, this is a 5% vancomycin mm. so we put that uh, dropper and give it to the patient so he will have three one is uh, concerned cefazolin concerned tobacin and vanco he will put okay. all three of them every one hour every one hour round the clock mm. the not, uh, because uh, somebody has to put around the night also but i am seeing corneal toxicity sir don't Those worry dogs. about that You see, at this point, my priority is to save the eye, not toxicity. Basak will control toxicity <laughs> because the reason, is, you know, the reason is because at this juncture, I want that, like Madam was saying, pressure should be controlled, and this drug should go inside the eye. Toxicity will taper this, you know, after some time. Toxicity is not the prime concern. I know ocular medicamentosa is a big subject. There have been, you know, webinars held on that. But at this juncture, when the eye is in crisis, you are in crisis. First aid is not toxicity. I, I i have two comments like uh, concentrated tobra tobramycin is not available freely injectable tobramycin specially you have to find out our combination in corneal infection point of view like when we see severe kind of this we give septa and cipro cipro recent study says that cipro the sensitivity level for gram negative is higher than any other look commercially available that's why even we uh, 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 our group of br surgeon they also give oral ciplo uh, yeah oral dose, ciplo double, we also give oral ciplo double dose oral ciplo so that 1000 mg bd or 750 mg bd and we give combination of hourly or half an hourly septa so two points ciplo. two points basaka said oral ciplox i also gave 1000 bd from the day as soon as the patient leaves the operation theater in fact i will give one iv ciplox at in the operation theater itself and oral uh, you know this will be given for not 5 days but more than 10 to 14 days will be given but i agree with that even uh, you know what malika said in intravitreal also because the spectrum is much higher even for gram negative it covers yeah so i have another comment like uh, i think uh, that i do not know who sir will discuss that whenever you see a case of end of your own case immediately antenna sh should be straight and the message should go should go to your your <coughs> all people that this has happened so there are 4 5 10 12 cases has been done Absolutely. the same or so call them call them because this patient came on third day they they four call them and now just think why it is happened so that means as the treatment of the patient will be going on at the same time the investigation internal investigation will be going on in your or your setup all this 
so, the past, so, absolutely. in the past we had two incidents of two in the same OR is having streptococcal pneumonia infection, diplococcus, and we did throat swab of the surgeon and the uh, scrub nurse, and both are positive a long time back, about eight, eight, Very, nine very nice back. points, very, very nice and points. Sir. both are positive for their oropharyngeal, I mean, so are positive for diplococci. Then we thought, it is a, just kind of assumption, but then genetic, all these things should be happened. But if you keep your antenna, I mean, very nice, very nice. Antenna should always be high, especially if you are dealing, because there have been now published data where if surgeon is talking too much on the table, it has been attributed, like Basaka said, even in interval injections also, that the culture from surgeon's throat as well as from your culture has the same genotypically also. So talking has to be minimized because, uh, and the other point was, you see, I remember I had three patients end off, so I stopped my OPD rang up everybody list, uh, you know, who got operated by, aapko to infection nahi hua, aapko nahi hua. So if it is a one case, then you don't do that. But if it is, you are in a hospital and the, you should search the entire list, kis kis ka surgery hua and try to find them that they are doing well or not. This is very important. Uh, suspecting fungal and ophthalmitis, how far is it really possible in the regular post-operative cases what we do? It's generally only the traumatic or uh, any trochlear uh, foreign body, but not in the regular post-operative no, no, regular post-ops also fungal happen often. Uh, it's not you see, yeah, especially in patients who are immunocompromised, they are on dialysis, so these patients may be slightly more prone to have fungus. Amen. Or if the contamination is there. Contamination. You see, it's never yeah. surgeon's not, fault. Not always contamination. I would say that even normal conjunctival flora does have con uh, fungal element. If you take 100 sample from normal individual, they does. So even they are not compromised and probably during surgery, you in excite them and they get a chance to go inside. So majority end of thalmitis occurs because of flora only. Yeah. Therefore the level one evidence is of betadine. Betadine aapko teen baar dal nahi hai, to one drop, one drop, one drop. So we maintain all that, but uh, immediate post-op when we are thinking of end of thalmitis, generally we give only the yeah, yes, yes, but not But, madam, you are right, you are right. Immediate postoperatively, majority it will not be fungal. It will not be fungal. But remember, fusarium has been reported on day one. On day one, fusarium has been reported. But what Basak said is very good. Tentacle should be high. Antenna should be high. That start thinking. We have to respond. Are you very good? Nee, are you? Think of something else. One point: We uh, operate in a rural area, sir. So routine post-op, we don't give bread. We give only antibiotic and dexamethasone because of the hygiene. What the patients can't manage. Precipitate of the bread. What you were saying, like the routine mild task, which nowadays we see in all the post-operative gets wet washed off with the prednisolone hourly what we give. So is it legible for us to give bread for the cases who are having mild inflammation on the first post-operative day? Or is it like we should give prednisolone for all the post-operative cases inevitably? Is it DEXA? Is it okay? I just want to get <laughs> opinion from Routine, Basak, what Madam is asking, routine, routine, routine post-operative, yeah. routine post-operative treatment. It post depends on your own practice and your population. She's from a rural, she's asking rural. rural. Setup, I think routine post-operative, you should give some form of steroid, whether, and that depends on your uh, type of surgery. No, DEXA or versus prednisolone. She's questioning DEXA versus prednisolone. No, 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 both are same, both are same that way, when from Entry inflammatory point of red is naturally higher, but both are same. Sometimes we avoid red because not very good red are available in the country and they cause a lot of precipitation. Problem, lash. problem with problem. Lash, yeah, lash yeah. and that clear yeah, madam, is very difficult. That's why we prefer the, clear solution. The reason she is asking is because Prednisolone tends to have that white, white, uh, and yeah. if the, if that, the, if the patient, why, that's why no, important is not precipitate, important is cleaning. If cleaning, they clean, yes, yes, that wound cleaning. may get compromised. That is, so that I is very uh, difficult. We'll, we'll, move to the, we'll move to the next talk, Dr. Rajesh Sinha, who's going to be talking about preoperative and intraoperative measures to prevent endothelmitis. We can continue the discussion after this. Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. Like always, uh, it was a wonderful talk, which actually is the complete thing in itself, and <laughs> it is, yeah. It doesn't. <laughs> so Rajesh is going to be yeah. talking about preoperative and intraoperative measures to prevent end of thalmitis. 
Thank you, ma'am. Uh, and just just going to the last point once again, maybe prednisolone phosphate will not cause deposits uh, in place of acetate, so we can use prednisolone phosphate. Uh, coming to the preoperative and intraoperative measures to prevent endophthalmitis, uh, there are certain preoperative measures which are there in the guidelines, and we have to uh, keep uh, you know keep all these things in mind. One is a good control of blood sugar, because a diabetic individual is prone, uh, more prone to develop endophthalmitis uh, and somebody who is having an uncontrolled diabetes, the risk of uh, developing endophthalmitis is higher because the patient is bound to develop some reaction and then that can get subsequently uh, infected and, uh, and if the blood sugar level is uncontrolled, then if there is an end off, the severity will be much higher. Then of course we have to uh, look at the NLD block, uh, press the sac, do syringing if possible, but don't do anything on the day of surgery, like don't do any syringing, don't do any biometry or tonometry on the day of surgery. It has to be done before that and see if there is any infection in the lid and adnexa. In that case, that has to be managed first, treated with antibiotics, and once the congestion resolves, you can, the best thing is if there is a congestion in the eye, you think there's, a, there's an infection in the ocular adnexa, the best thing is to send a swab and then start uh, treatment with broad spectrum antibiotics and then of course you get to know uh, how the patient is resolving and then plan the surgery at a later date. Uh, Preoperative topical antibiotics, we, most of us we give and there was a recommendation earlier that it has to be given but these days uh, it has uh, not been considered as a mandatory thing but uh, uh, most of us we do give because we want to play safe, we want to uh, you know, reduce the uh, normal bacterial load on the ocular surface. But what is uh, mandatory is uh, use of povidone iodine 5% in the eye. And I, I would just like to emphasize 5%. Why? Because uh, normally 10% betadine is available and you have to dilute it uh, by 50%. That is important for the, in, uh, for the use on the ocular surface. 10% is good for the skin, periocular skin. Uh, there is no need uh, for clipping the lashes, as you can see here, the, the uh, drape has nicely covered the lashes and there is no, these days we don't clip the lashes. As far as intraoperative measures is concerned, the adequate OT sterilization is important. Then uh, uh, the important, the, the common uh, method of sterilization these days uh, that we use is use of bacillosid. We do spray of uh, bacillosid uh, 2% and then keep the room closed for 5-6 hours and then uh, that suffices. UV radiation is also useful but it has to be stopped uh, at least 2-3 hours before uh, somebody enters the uh, operation theater. Periodic cultures to be taken every 1-3 to three months time. You can uh, take moist stab, uh, swabs taken from microscope and head end of the table. You can keep uh, blood agar plates uh, open uh, for 30 minutes uh, at the head end of the table and that is how you uh, get to know whether there is any significant infection or not. Of course, colony count of more than 10 is significant and any, uh, uh, even a single gram negative bacillus or a fungal colony is something which is suspicious and we have to uh, go ahead and do something for the OT sterilization. Oat, then uh, sterilization of instruments is very essential and that's again a big uh, uh, topic to discuss. But yes, we preferably use ETO or autoclave or plasma. That is better, but there are other methods as well to sterilize the instruments and that can be done. The best thing is, ideal thing is the use of uh, disposable instruments mostly. And if you use disposable uh, items uh, uh, largely, then the risk of infection will be less. And of course, we use chemical indicators to look for the uh, monitoring of sterilization of these instruments. And uh, the general guideline is this, that if you are introducing any, any instrument in the eye, then it should not be reused in the other patient without sterilization. So it has to be uh, sterilized. Adequate hand washing is important. If you are using betadine or chlorhexidine scrub, then it should be done for three minutes. If you are using any liquid soap, it should be done for five minutes and bar soaps should be preferably avoidable. And uh, the important do's and don'ts should be there on the wall of the, uh, the scrubbing area or area adjacent to the main uh, operation theater so that people uh, you know, follow that. 
and proper gowning and gloving is essential. Somebody who is using a gown and has gone out, then in that case, I'm sorry, uh, then in that case, uh, the uh, surgeon has to come back and uh, remove his gown, wash and scrub again, and uh, these things should be followed. Mask should properly cover nose and mouth, and uh, OT cap should cover all the hair. The position of hand after you have scrubbed, it should be above the waist, and uh, we should document every event that has happened in the surgery in order to have a nice uh, post-op monitoring. A patient should also uh, be cleaned, the eye, the periocular area should be cleaned, so the skin around the, uh, around the eye should be cleaned with betadine, 10%, and uh, uh, once, you, if you are putting in, inside the eye, you have to dilute, as I said earlier. So, as I said, for calde sac, conjunctival sac, we have to use 5% povidone iodine and outside skin we should use 10% povidone iodine. Povidone iodine is mostly available, as uh, to my information, in 10% solution. So, if you are putting inside the eye, in that case you have to dilute it because otherwise it will cause some toxicity to the ocular surface. So, 5% uh, povidone iodine inside the eye and leave for one minute and that suffices the, uh, the sterilization of that area. And then uh, as far as irrigating bottle is concerned, a large majority of our uh, cluster end off they happen because of the uh, irrigating fluid. So we should inspect the irrigating fluid, whether there's any suspended material in that. Uh, and of course, once you have used the irrigating fluid, we should keep some sample of it so that we get to know in case the patient develops end off, then we get to know the culture of, uh, by doing culture of the fluid, we get to know the organism and that is also very useful. Intracameral antibiotic is very useful uh, and has been considered, uh, has been recommended by large majority of studies, studies done outside, studies done in India. and. Uh, and uh, uh, they have all recommended that intracameral moxifloxacin can be used. Uh, uh, the simple, uh, simple method of doing what I follow is that after doing the surgery, once the lens is in the bag, you hydrate the wound, ensure that they, you know, sometimes you have to tuck the IOL optic to, bring it, to put it in the bag. So hydrate it, form the chamber, and once uh, it has been done, then uh, uh, after hydrating the side port, you just uh, see that the, it's well, uh, it's reasonably tight. Then you uh, inject intracameral moxifloxacin and just you enter the side port and push from there. So it will, as you enter, there will be slight egress of fluid. So there will be space created and you just push the moxifloxacin. It will go directly and uh, towards the bag. Don't take your cannula too much inside to put it, uh, put moxifloxacin in the bag. Then the chamber will become very shallow. Again, you'll have to hydrate. We'll have to form the chamber, and then the concentration of the moxifloxacin will reduce. There are many studies that have shown a good uh, outcome of uh, use of uh, intracranial moxifloxacin. And of course, wound security is another important thing to prevent. Uh, uh, endophthalmitis. If you feel that the wound is leaky, you should try to hydrate. Hydrate the wound. If you are in doubt, then you can put an air bubble, hydrate the wound, and if the bubble becomes smaller, this means that it has become watertight. There's no leak of water, because if there's any leakage of water, the bubble will increase in size. And if at all there's a doubt, one should not hesitate in putting a suture. So, in conclusion, uh, endophthalmitis, yes, it is on decline because of so many reasons, because of awareness, because of uh, involvement of uh, the ophthalmologist uh, aggressively in this area. And uh, we should take appropriate preoperative and intraoperative measures and uh, adequate sterilization of the instruments, the OT, and intracameral antibiotics are helpful. Well, not mandatory, I would say, because large majority of uh, doctors, they don't inject intracameral, but it is recommended. It has been recommended in most of the studies, and, and as far as uh, you'll be safer if you have given and documented, so that, uh, because uh, in case of litigation, you'll be a little safer. You can say that you have followed everything. Otherwise, these days, uh, these uh, advocates, the lawyers, they 
uh, Google everything and get to know that, okay, you have not injected this drug intracamerally. But the most important thing, once again, I will emphasize is the role of 5% povidone iodine in the calde sac. Keep it for one minute just before the surgery and then wash it off. And uh, that uh, prevents the risk of endophthalmitis in large majority of cases. So thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Rajesh. I think it was a wonderful uh, talk, more so because it was on prophylaxis and you covered everything really very well. Yes? Yep, sir, do you suggest any additional uh, precautions to be taken of sterilization of the instruments that we use for HVSAG and HIV cases that we do in cataracts? Other than that, disposable. Yeah. See, for HIV and uh, all these uh, HSV and uh, HCV cases, uh, uh, what we follow is that we do it uh, as the last case, wherein uh, we take all the precautions, uh, uh, the, uh, everything, the surgeon's precaution has to be taken as in terms of mask, in terms of uh, covering uh, the eye, etc., as well as the nice cap and separate gown. So, uh, all the surgeon's precaution is taken and as far as patient precaution is concerned, it's the same as in any other case. So, uh, the only thing is that most of the times when you uh, do the surgery, after that you have to close the OT because you don't do any other case after that. So, uh, yes, sir, the instruments what we are using for that cases, can it be gone to the routine sterilization and what we generally do is we are separating the instrument sets of HVSAG and HIV as two different sets. And we use only those sets for the positive cases. Absolutely. That, th that is the way. And plus, uh, obviously, it has to be uh, separated because uh, it shouldn't be mixed with other instruments. And proper thorough washing, uh, I guess a bit more aggressive cleaning is done before it is put into the so sterilization. Even, according to the books and protocols, we see that hypo is used for a prior wash of that instruments. Because of that, our instruments are becoming a bit more blunt and our quality of HVSAG and HIV cases output is coming down. So, is it is it okay if we do the only the regular sterilization what we do with the other instruments or do we really need that additional uh, dipping of the instruments, uh, additional half an hour more in the hypo and then going it for the sterilization? See, uh, isopropyl the, alcohol has been found to be useful but the only thing is that it, there is precipitation and it for sharp yes. instrument it, it is uh, yes. not very useful. So, uh, as far as sterilization is concerned, if we have a good uh, quality sterilizer like plasma or uh, autoclave, I think that should suffice. Only thing is that, the only thing is that it, these instruments should be kept separately. As far as possible, try to use disposable instruments and uh, the remaining instruments which are not disposable, these should be kept separately. Thorough cleaning should be done separately, not along with other instruments, and then uh, it can be sterilized in autoclave. Thank you. I think we'll move on to the next talk because uh, we have to finish the session on time. And it is a pleasure always to request my very good friend, Dr. Malika Goel, uh, to talk on, I think, one of her favorite topics, and that's with yeah, and thank Dr. You. Thank you very much, Dr. Namrata, for this opportunity. Uh, it's okay. So, uh, I'll be speaking on vitrectomy for endophthalmitis, but it's not just vitrectomy. Look for other things that may have to be corrected surgically, such as uh, wound leak, vitreous in the wound, if there's an abscess that has to be managed, or if there is a, uh, a DCR has to be done. Then before going into surgery, look for e extent of exudates, if there is a dropped nucleus as well, which has to be managed, IOL in the vitreous, retinal detachment, or a choroidal detachment, a giant retinal tear, retinal detachment itself. So these are the things we need to know before we go in. They affect the prognosis as well as the approach to surgery will be different. And as was discussed, we start some oral uh, systemic antibiotics to reduce the number of subsequent interventions required, which can be oral levofloxacin, which has a better bioavailability than ciprofloxacin, or sometimes linezolate, and in uh, fungal, oral voriconazole has extremely good vitreous bioavailability. Now, just to show why we must give systemic antibiotics, this is a bilateral endogenous end off. We treated only the right eye with vitrectomy, but you see the left has also cleared, and that's only because of the oral levofloxacin. Now, what are the indications for vitrectomy when the IOAB has failed, intravitreal injection has failed, or there are very dense exudates, raised IOP, suspected fungus, 
uh, organism sequestered in capsular bag and sometimes when they come late onset, low grade smoldering infections, those also require vitrectomy rather than IOAB. Diabetes, the lower threshold should be there for vitrectomy rather than IOAB. And similarly also for intravitreal injection induced endophthalmitis, lower threshold for vitrectomy. And generally I can combine these two drugs for the fungus infections nowadays because even fungi can be resistant to one or the other of these. So a combination is in fact synergistic. And sometimes you may have hypersensitivity in the patient to M4B. So if there's recurrent inflammation after vitrectomy with M4, change to voriconazole. And these have, nowadays there are uh, sensitivity to fungal isolates which can guide you to treatment which, or, which medicine to be used. And uh, these are the various panels for which you can send the sample. For example, this was an endogenous end off where the diagnosis was not clear, systemic infections were also there. And we just sent this sample for uh, exciton and we got that it was tuberculosis, mycobacterium TB. So the patient improved uh, systemically also. Most of the cases we can get away with the core vitrectomy where we do not reach the posterior vitreous, PVD is not induced. It shortens the course of the disease. And at the end of the surgery, we give an intravitreal uh, antibiotic injections with generally very good results. If it's uh, a lot of material in the anterior chamber, it is important to first clean that out so that you can see the vitreous. Before you can go inside uh, posteriorly, you need to clean the anterior chamber. And if it's a post-trab endophthalmitis, the bleb has to be managed post-operatively with intensive topical antibiotics. But now severe endophthalmitis, particularly fungal endophthalmitis, is a different ball game. It requires a complete and early vitrectomy in the, early, in the first instance, which means PVD induction, removal of posterior hyaloid, aspiration of premacular exudates, and removing all exudates. And this I have learned from experience. This is not textbook. Uh, this reduces macular problems, prevents reactivation of infection, reducing the need for resurgery, improving overall outcomes. So this is what happens, uh, there's a macular hypopion in a severe fungal endophthalmitis. And if you don't do a proper vitrectomy, you end up with a maculopathy, something called endophthalmitis, maculopathy, poor visual outcome. Now first vitrectomy, we had done a core vitrectomy, so we are not able to now in the second vitrectomy, we are not able to remove the premacular exudates. You see, I'm trying it, but not happening. So putting in a vitrector, aspiration, remove the posterior hyaloid, eat away the hyaloid, and now you can access the premacular exudates with a soft tip. Now this is not just cosmetic reasons, it is because it prevents reactivation of infection, it is to save the globe, not just the vision. Sometimes you cannot enter the premacular space from the posterior pole, so in that case do a peripheral vitrectomy, enter the subhyloid space from the periphery and then work your way posteriorly to reach the premacular exudates as in this case. Because unless you remove these exudates, they will continue to cause reinfection. And these are the balls of exudates and fungus which do not respond to the intravitreal fungal antifungal agents because those are fungi static. So we have to mechanically remove each ball going close to the retina, shaving it. If necessary, we may do laser if we feel we have created breaks. But this is just to salvage the globe. I'm not even talking of the vision. And prolonged treatment is required in fungal infections. Do not be surprised if six to 12 months of in, uh, systemic voriconazole is required with multiple intravitreal injections and vitrectomies. Up to one year may be required just to clean out the globe and make it sterile. Now, this is an endogenous end off with the aspergillus. Uh, the diagnosis was not clear before I went inside the case. So, but because I had learned from experience, we did a complete vitrectomy in the first go. I felt it was fungus. So, and it turned out to be aspergillus. So normally we do a core vitrectomy, but in this patient, because it looked like fungus, I have gone close to the macula and uh, stripped off the posterior hyaloid. And we had a good uh, result. You see, we have removed, stripped off the posterior hyaloid with aspiration and then removing it with a good result. So in the first instance, complete vitrectomy in severe cases. Silicon oil can be used in some situations, but I personally do not prefer it. it maintains clear media, prevents retinal detachment, it actually acts like an anti uh, antibiotic itself. The, you can have endophthalmitis with a white, quiet eye, 
in certain situations. Patient is also asymptomatic, have a very high index of suspicion. If patient is on immunosuppressives or following an intravitreal steroid or even just intravitreal any injections, the front can be quiet because the injection has been given in the vitreous and that delays the diagnosis. So this is an immunosuppressed patient for Morin's ulcer and the diagnosis was delayed because there was no pain, no uh, redness, uh, altering the prognosis. Similarly, post vitrectomy, IVTA, the eye is white, patient has no complaints, so the diagnosis gets delayed and results are poor. Now, post uh, DSEC endophthalmitis, important here is to identify that the most of the cases, the source is the corneal button, so remove that early. It may not look as if the cornea is the source in this case, so we continued to do vitrectomy, intravitreal injections and realized that it was the cornea that was the problem, but by that time it is too late. So unless you remove the corneal button, which we finally did, and then only the infection will resolve. Just managing the posterior segment is not going to help, and after PK only, we could get resolution. Also, I have seen a couple of cases where they look post, they come post-op in the immediate post-op period or slightly later with severe inflammation post cataract surgery and this is not end off though it looks like. It is actually neovascular glaucoma which has been precipitated by a untreated PDR or ocular ischemia syndrome caused by the cataract surgery. So when we treat the, as I operate this patient, you realize you are not removing exudates, you are removing blood. And then you do a PRP and intravitreal anti-VEGF rather than antibiotics. A recurrent pupillary membrane in the setting of an endophthalmitis, you should remove the IOL. It will not go away by just keeping on removing the membrane. You are the surgeon, my anterior segment surgeon refused to remove the IOL, kept removing the membrane, doing YAG uh, PI for the raised IOP. Finally, the resolution was only when the patient went elsewhere and the IOL was removed. IOL dislocation in an endophthalmitis can be a relative emergency because the retina is inflamed, tears easily, and we had the IOL going into the subretinal space and it was submacular by the time I operated. And there was a large tear inferiorly, so the inflamed retina tears easily by the IOL and should be removed earlier. <coughs> Post-injection endophthalmitis may look white, painless, but comes with exudates and loss of vision, have a lower threshold for vitrectomy <coughs> because the dose is in the vitreous. Usually they do not respond to intravitreal injection alone, usually, not always. And sometimes when you remove, do a vitrectomy, they come back with a, the macular problem getting worse because you have removed the anti-VEGF. So we started injecting an anti-VEGF also at the time of injecting and intravitreal uh, antibiotic with better results. Post-IVTA may come as, as late as one month to five months after a, a steroid injection because the steroid suppresses inflammation and the patient may come with full vitreous, no symptoms. And whenever a contaminated drug has caused an infection, it is very different from a uh, breach of protocol uh, infection because that is much more, uh, the, the volume of organisms is much more, it is more destructive. I think I will leave this particular so that we have the next talk. Thank you. Wonderful, Malika. Very, very nice collection. Rarely you will see so many collection of videos with one person. And I think... Uh, all of us uh, have learned quite a bit and one biggest is that you have to save the globe and in that uh, you have to do a complete vitrectomy even at the cost of uh, peeling of the hyaloid don't be afraid to peel the hyaloid in inflamed eyes even if sometimes retina may tear you can do laser as she had shown but ultimately globe has to be saved okay. so thanks malika for excellent collection of videos Okay, so this now is. We have the uh, uh, chair, chairperson, scientific committee, the past secretary of AIUS, because this job she undertook when she was secretary of AIUS, and uh, uh, we were, uh, you know, in the office, and this we had this task uh, uh, reported from all across the country. So it was the onus of AIUS to, you know, do something about the benefit of our members. So uh, Namrata will present uh, how did we tackle this task epidemic. Thank you, sir. I think uh, uh, this TAS outbreak occurred uh, last year, and it was reported from several cities in uh, some kind of intraocular lenses from all over the country. And under the leadership of uh, Dr. Lalit Verma, who at that time was the president of All India Ophthalmological Society, we did take certain steps. So as soon as it is, it was uh, reported, communication was sent on an urgent basis to all in the country. 
and uh, the second communication again uh, went and we requested all the members to send sealed sample of the intraocular lenses from the batches that enclosed uh, for fair evaluation to the headquarter. And then we did have an open forum discussion on which uh, we uh, discussed everything that was uh, related to TAS. A survey of, on TAS was done for this particular episode and there were about 42 people who uh, reported to the survey and uh, the responses were how many surgeries, especially the ones who had had TAS on that particular OT or that particular OR. And there were several responses on the numbers of the cases they had it undertaken, numbers where TAS was reported, what was the visual acuity, uh, what were the features, pain, corneal edema, whether it was there or not, did they use steroids, what was the pupil, and all the features uh, which we've already discussed. And if aqueous and vitreous step was sent and what was the report as well as the type of the surgery and the method of sterilization and the reuse of the instruments. Then we have managing committee members and again to them also we send communication so that in their respective states they could report it. All these samples were sent to laboratories and we sent this uh, which were received from the AIOS office packets were made and these were sent to the laboratories as well as to the company uh, where the, uh, the uh, intraocular lens was implicated and as is customary also to the regulatory, appro uh, regulatory authorities. Now, uh, uh, task registry is already in place on the AIOS website and this has now been renamed as ocular Adver adverse event registry. So if there is an ocular adverse event which you have, you can always go to the AIOS website and you can report it. That helps us to know whether a particular kind of ocular adverse event, whether it is TAS or it is endophthalmitis, is related uh, to the operation theater because always it may not be related to operation theaters. It may be because of the disposables that you are using. It could be irrigating solution, it could be viscoelastic, it could be intraocular lenses. And although uh, the surgeon is generally responsible for that, the uh, manufacturing companies uh, do not hold or do not share responsibility for that. And sometimes it can be because of the products and not because of the surgical environment and not because of the surgery itself or the surgeon. So uh, uh, this uh, registry was renamed, is now renamed as Ocular Adverse Event Registry. And we had sent this to two laboratories and both the laboratories said that there were no, uh, no organisms or no, uh, uh, nothing that was reported which could be incriminated for the task. And this is, both the laboratories were certified and government approved. So in the, in the, uh, uh, in the amount or the concentrations that we should have these endotoxins, it was not present actually. Then subsequently to remove bias, we also sent it to the US uh, laboratory. And in the US laboratory as well, uh, we did not find uh, any endotoxins, but we did, they did report pyrogens. But as uh, it would have it in by FDA also, that if pyrogens are present, then they are not prerequisites for TAS. So these are the steps that we had taken, and of course the samples were withdrawn. And uh, subsequently now uh, uh, it was not reported ever since that. But this I want to just highlight that once an adverse event happens, you should ro report immediately and all of us have to get on the common platform. Subsequently a representation was also made uh, to the uh, authorities, that is to Cedesco as well as to DCGI that not only the surgeons should be incriminated when an ocular adverse event like endophthalmitis or TAS occurs, but the owners and responsibility should also lie with the manufacturers because sometimes uh, it may be that uh, the manufacturers are at a fault and surgeons get wrongly blamed for it. So the responsibility should be shared um, equally, if not equally, then partly by the manufacturing companies as well. So these are some of the reports and then all the steps taken uh, during TAS. So thank you very much for your kind attention and I think this was a very important topic, TAS and end of thalmitis. I would request Dr. Samar Basak to please uh, conclude the session. For uh, this complete session and in 2007 we heard a uh, uh, lecture in ESCRS which one is the deadliest? Is there anything 
words than endophthalmitis. That time there is a nice lecture. I have forgotten the name of the uh, professor who has given, but it came out TAS. Because endophthalmitis, you can always, as Molika will also agree, the early intervention and immediate, it will, most of the cases solves the problem. But TAS, sometimes it is so severe, it goes on, 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 and on. You do whatever, ultimately, that eyes goes to thysical. So you must remember this too, and that's why TAS is also important, and you have to report if there is a cluster of three, four, five patients in your setup, and try to investigate and try to find out the reasons. Thank you very much for your Thank patience you. hearing. So our next session will be on. Yes. Uh, just one question, Dr. Namrata. So is it now legally that the responsibility, responsibility will be shared by manufacturers or is it no, still no, not legal? It is still not there, still but not this there. is something which we have to yeah, work on. We have to work push on. for it.